welcome to UNED Foundation debate on the future of European cinema. Today's debate is being broadcast live online and on air with our partner channels. You can be part of the debate posting on our Facebook page and you can send questions to our guests using the hashtag Curtains Up Europe. The European Union's Creative Europe program makes a substantial contribution to European cinema. It aims to strengthen Europe's cultural and creative sectors and it's seen as vital to the development and promotion and distribution of European films. Creative Europe was launched in January 2014 with a budget of almost one and a half billion euros over seven years. Joining us to discuss the role cinema plays in European culture and economy, Michel Magnier, Director of Culture and Creativity at the European Commission's Director General for Education and Culture, Carlo Crestedina, producer of The Wonders, winner of the Jury Grand Prix at this year's Cannes Film Festival, Andre Lange, head of the Department of Information and Markets and Financing at the Council of Europe's European Audiovisual Observatory, and film director Daniel Manns, whose first film, Between Summer and Fall, is about to commence post-production. We're also joined by students from the UNED Foundation University Circle, Ilana Panzer from the University of Tampere in Finland, and Alexander Boyeran from UBB in Romania. Today also we have Leticia Makakis joining us uh, who will take care of our social media input and you can send your messages directly to her. Hi Leticia. Hi Brian and hello everybody. Yes indeed I will be following up all your comments, reactions and questions on our social media. So if you want to join and participate just use the hashtag Curtains Up Europe on Facebook and Twitter. Let's start. Thanks Leticia. We're going to go through six different topics today and give uh, uh, Europe a really great idea of what it takes to make a film and what it takes to get it distributed. We're going to start with the concept of what is European cinema. Michel Manu, what is European cinema? Well, first of all, is the cinema which is produced by the European countries. Uh, I mean, it, ha it has a specific uh, value for us because it's the expression of our cultural identity. So we want to promote it. Uh, we want it to circulate widely. We want to export it to the rest of the world. So that's not something you define easily, but that's something which is very dear to the heart of all uh, European citizens. OK, André Lange, is it as easy to define as that? Well, there are plenty of definitions of what is uh, one European film, and I will not go into details because uh, it may lead to very uh, difficult discussion, legal, political, statistical. Kind of like that. Uh, uh, but let's say that for us at the Observatory, we are in charge of uh, providing statistics on the European film market. So we have a very pragmatical definition of what is European film. It's a film produced in Europe. No, you can discuss it is a 28 Europe or is it a enlarged Europe, the Council of Europe, uh, including Russia, including Turkey, including uh, Georgia. But there is one problem, uh, major uh, statistical problem, which is economic and uh, polit political one. It's do you consider US films produced yes. in Europe as European or not? And there are various views in Europe on this. And if you count James Bond or Harry Potter as British or as more Americans than British, you have complete different statistics. Okay. Carlo, what's your view? What is the European film? Well, it's very difficult to say. It's like asking what is poetry? What is poetry? Well, what is poetry? Poetry is prophecy in a way, the ability to read the present and uh, to interpret it. Well, yes, I would say that I see as distinctive in European cinema an effort to spread knowledge through cinema, not just entertain, and to ask difficult questions about who we are. I like the idea that cinema is uh, a very important tool to define and build a European identity, but I also like the idea that identities are not fixed, are not given, that identities are a process. And when we try to freeze them in a single definition, to me, they become a little bit dangerous sometimes. Okay. okay, Daniel, did you have an experience of filmmaking as well? Does this give you an appreciation of what European filmmaking is about? I think um, European filmmaking is uh, everybody makes a film in the country from which he comes from. So I'm, I by definition made a German movie, but what does that may mean? Um, I think as a filmmaker you try to express yourself and 
not necessarily think so much about what culture you represent because you're basically trying to tell a story and if that's not a story that's that's fixed on something that can only be told in your country or has some historic context um, then then you're making first and foremost a film and only by definition um, a European film or a German film or from whatever country you come from and I don't think that these things have to be exclusive that European films have to be more um, more, more uh, social, with more social value, and they, but, but they can also entertain with that. Does language matter? I think that's um, a huge problem with European films because that's the, that's the, 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 the dominance of, of English speaking films. I mean, that's the, the language we're speaking here, yeah. no matter where we come from. And then you have this, this problem of are people going to watch films with subtitles? Okay. Iliana, what do you think? What's European cinema for you? Uh, as we see, it's really hard to say what's a European film. I think it's maybe deficient uh, that you said uh, European movies, film that is produced in Europe. But I don't think that uh, if Americans come here to make a film, it isn't European film anymore. Okay, Alexandra, for you, what do you think European film is? Um, for me, European cinema means culture, uh, possibility to develop new skills, uh, to promote talented people. Okay, Carlo, the, the sense of, of who we are today, are we non-American or, or have we rejected so much of American culture that we can separate ourselves from that or is there anything which is truly European anymore? I grew up in a small town <clears throat> in North Italy and there was this um, game or jog that we used to, to do when we were younger. It was um, where, which are the borders of our little town? Where does our town ends? And where does the countryside start? And everybody had a different definition, but when you are in the city, you know that you are there. So it's a little bit like that. And, you know, what we are is something that, again, is difficult to define, but you can feel, you can perceive. Yeah. Um, I was thinking while listening all these um, opinions that the more uh, relevant a film or a director or a producer become the last nationalities. Our brothers are then Belgian. Nah, they are European. Is a naked Belgian? Is is Nanni Moretti Belgian? Matteo Garrone or is uh, sorry Italian or or, or or Matteo Garrone Italian and and so on? Is Ken Loach British? I don't know. I like the idea that they they are all European directors in the film okay. we make. Try okay, their best to be European. Michelle, are we dealing with nationality or philosophy, intellectual positioning? Yeah, that's very difficult, honestly. Uh, I mean, I think we're all aware of the fact that there's a specificity of the European uh, cinema. Uh, that's not only entertainment, that's not only a product, that's also part of our culture, as I said. And that's why when we discuss free trade with the United States, we impose that we don't discuss cinema at all. We don't want cinema to be subject to the rules of free trade. Well, we didn't, the French imposed. We the Europeans, uh, we the Europeans. Because we have the feeling that there's a different uh, understanding of what cinema is on the other side of the Atlantic. So we don't want this to be part of a bigger uh, free trade uh, okay. space. We want to keep that for us. Okay, Daniel, when you see Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, Mr. Clooney, the recently married Mr. Clooney, coming to Europe to make uh, sometimes more philosophical films, sometimes films with a stronger message. Uh, how does that mess up our perception of what a European film is? I have to agree with, with what was said before that um, it's, it's still an American film because I think that's more the way of how it's marketed. And I mean, the, these are in that terms less cultural subvention uh, payments, but but um, business incentives. Okay. 
And but I, do you I really think, think that in this stage of their careers, Angelina Jolie in particular, is making films which are based on a, uh, a financial uh, gain, or is she trying to make statements which are really more in line with a, a European philosophy? I think in that particular case, um, it's, it's difficult to say, but there are many um, productions that, that come to Europe. For example, I mean, we have that in Germany with, with uh, the Babelsberg Studios, okay. where a lot of American films are produced. And um, I mean, they get fun, German funding, uh, cultural funding. Okay. And sometimes I think the lines are difficult to say okay. where is is it cultural funding and where is it as a or business on, incentive. On the, on the funding issue as well, do you define European film according to the percentage of funding uh, and where that originates from? Yeah, for, for the statistics, we take the nationality of the producer or the main producer in case of co-production, which sometimes leads to paradox. Uh, my favorite example was uh, the film by uh, Youssef Shaheen, the great Egyptian uh, filmmaker. It was mainly produced by a French producer. So from a statistical point of view, uh, Shane films really the expression of Egypt culture are French. <laughs> the statistics, economic statistics for this is a limit in the, in the possibility of analyzing the, the cultural exchange. On the contrary, well, if you take uh, Harry Potter, Harry Potter is produced mainly by uh, Warner Money, but the script is British, the casting is British, the special effects are British, and it's financed basically with a fiscal incentive in UK. So the British say it's British, so it's European. Okay. Of course, from a continental point of view, we may be a bit more reluctant, but uh, it's one example of the difficulty of defining the things. Okay. Let's, let's uh, see if we have any input from our social media. Tisha. Yes, Brian, actually, yes, we have quite a funny comment on Facebook from Annika Griezmann. She says, everyone is trying to copy the American movies and not the European movies. There is perhaps a reason I prefer Patrick Jane than Derek. So maybe, Brian, one of your guests can just react on this comment. Yeah, no, it, do, what do you think? Is, is, uh, is, is the essence of the American uh, filmmaking just more attractive? <laughs> it seems to be. But I why? don't think. Why? Why do you think that would be? <laughs> because of its history, it has a long history, and the Hollywood thing, and all all those things, and the actors and the directors and so on, all know them. But uh, all the European people so don't know. So brand recognition, really, the knowing the actors. I think that's. Uh, so you can trust them. Yeah, m maybe trust. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our second theme. We're going to talk about the market, how the EU cinema market operates. Andre, what's the structure of the market? How does it break down in, in terms of, of uh, financing, in terms of, and just in general terms of finance, but also the, the kind of channels, distribution channels that we have, video on demand, uh, cinema goers, this kind of thing? Well, I think the first thing we have to say is that the European market is dominated by the US uh, structure of distribution. Uh, U.S. major studio for uh, theatrical distribution, uh, pay TV, uh, which are mainly owned by uh, American uh, uh, companies or groups. Uh, now the VOD services in Europe, the leading one, are under U.S. control, whatever iTunes, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, Google Play. Uh, the, the major problem for uh, Europe, European films, is to face this domination of the, of the market. Uh, now, I think one of the major problems um, is the fact that the national films which have success are mainly comedies. Comedies who could make millions of admissions, very rarely uh, comedies will circulate. You have the case of Intouchable, French comedy of make, I think, 45 million admissions in the world, but it's really one exception. Some British comedies uh, uh, travel very well, but uh, in general, a French comedy, one Italian comedy, a German comedy, not to speak of a, a Danish comedy or one Estonian comedy, will not tr travel. So my favorite argument is to say that Europe is divided by laugh. We don't laugh of the same thing. And of course, language is part of this. I mean, uh, the humor is mainly through, through the language and uh, people do not understand uh, translating uh, humor sub with subtitles does not make laugh. Okay. And this is one of the major problems. And as a paradox, uh, the film, uh, the art house films, so the film d'auteur, okay. which in general are much more uh, 
serious, dramatic on, on uh, historical oh. topic or, or in okay, existential let, let crisis ask, uh, topic, circulate proportionally better than uh, comedies. Of course, they have much less admissions, yeah. but they circulate better. Okay, Carlo, you see this, uh, this positioning. Would you prefer to make a comedy uh, for the European market or the global market, or would you prefer to make a, a more universal theme? Well, comedies are difficult because humor is very much based on, on language. Um, it would be, it, it's a challenge, a very, would be a very interesting challenge to try to produce uh, some sort of European humor. We have it across um, the street. <laughs> we are at the moment trying to produce a film, we are about to, to, to produce a film on bilinguism in northern Italy. You may know that we have a uh, a region which is German, speak, they, where they speak German and Italian, and <laughs> all the jokes that uh, generate uh, from all the possible misunderstanding. Let's see if it will. Uh, but for uh, you, would you make uh, when you're deciding, you look at the market. Yeah. Are you looking at admission sales to the cinema? Or are you looking at uh, pay TV? How do you see the market divided up if you really want to make it successful? Well, it's changing a lot. I think that Andre can provide us with some statistic, but the number of downloads, uh, I'm talking about legal downloads at the moment, um, uh, is increasing dramatically year by year. So, and, and it's fascinating. Uh, it's, it's a revolution that it's going on under our feet. And sometimes we, we act as we don't perceive it, but it's happening. Box office is very important. We like very much the experience of the theater and you know, sharing the experience of, of watching a, a film on big screen. We spend a lot, we producer spend a lot of money, our directors and autos spend a lot of energy on making the sound perfect, the image perfect, and then you see youngster watching your film on an iPhone. And most of people is most of our outrage say, "Oh no!" I say, "Okay, forget about it. Okay, let them eat it. Let the, them nourish themselves with it." Michelle, to feed the people, what's the the, the commission's view of the the, the diet uh, of cinema across Europe? How does uh, divide up on the menu? Well, we we would really like to increase circulation of European films. We just saw uh, internally or externally. Well, both actually, but mostly internally. We think it's it's a pity that films, European films, they don't circulate within the EU in different countries. Why do you think they don't circulate, other than language? It's probably the, the language. I mean, there are also some cultural elements that people are not so much interested of uh, local stories okay. built for a local public. I think language is a problem. Either you subtitle films or you dub film. And in both cases, there's a loss of substance for the film. Okay. Uh, and that's why the program you mentioned, Creative Europe Focus, is very much on uh, support to distribution of, uh, of European films. Okay. okay. Daniel. Uh, this, the Danish uh, series Borgen, perhaps you know it, it's, in the UK this is a phenomenal, phenomenal success. If you had said 10 years ago that a Danish uh, political series was going to be one of the most watched programs in the UK when it's subtitled in English, spoken in the Danish language, which almost nobody outside Denmark understands, people wouldn't have said that would work, but it has worked. Is there something changing in Europe in terms of the market and how we distribute and how, how our cultural awareness has grown? I mean, what the internet has brought us it's not only the availability, um, which is one thing, and how that is de developing right now. I mean, from how many people have already access to legal downloads and know how to use that, because, I mean, people are used to going to the cinema or just um, uh, t t turning on their TV and seeing what is what is uh, given to them. But now when, when the selection is, is more complex, we ha I, I think th it's it's rather difficult now while it is so new to see how that will be developing but I think the, what the internet has definitely brought us is the aware, awareness because like like 15 years ago you didn't know that there was such a series in in, uh, in, this in accidental another country brand awareness, awareness in a way huh? this accidental brand awareness I think it's it's the brand awareness what uh, is no, I, I couldn't comment on that. I think what, what happened with the internet is that, that people have one way of, of telling each other. Okay. And, and th then, you know, you have these, these phenomena where people suddenly say, oh, this is a series from Denmark and this is okay. great. 
Yana, your, your colleagues at university, do they watch more online or do they go to the cinema more? Well, I actually uh, made a bit of gallop and most of them are watching from Netflix. Okay. But they also go to the cinema sometimes. But okay. I think the net, Netflix is the greatest thing. Okay. Alexandra, your friends, where do they watch their cinema? Uh, online. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Letitia. Yes, Brian. Any comments on the social media on this? Actually, I've got an interesting one from Veronica on Facebook, who is calling for more promotion on European films. Raise awareness for European films while still in production, media days, invitation to the set, etc. I'm a film journalist at RTV Sloven National Radio and TV, and I get tons of info on USA films in advance, but on European films, not so much. So why? Okay, so we'll come back to that a little bit when we're talking about uh, distribution as well. Um, the problems of, of the, the knowledge, just like Daniel was talking about, the knowledge of the product and being able to access it from there. We're going to move on to a third theme, the finance. We're going to start with uh, Andre this time. How is uh, European cinema financed? Well, the values way, but uh, one general characteristic of uh, European films is that they are uh, largely supported by uh, public money or let's say public schemes to uh, support the production. There are various ways uh, there is direct funding and the direct funding may be based on money collected from the, the lottery. This is the case in UK or in Finland. It may be based on levies on the revenues of distributors, exhibitors, uh, broadcasters. Uh, now also there is debate on uh, levies on the revenues of VOD operators. This go in a national fund who will distribute uh, the money to the uh, to the producer and th there is also uh, more and more and we, we will just release a, a study on this uh, next week uh, system of in fiscal incentives okay uh, tax rebate uh, tax shelter uh, it seems to work well for Ireland doesn't it in Ireland uh, in Belgium and in, in France uh, uh, also now in uh, in the Eastern European countries in uh, in Czech Republic, Hungary, okay. uh, even the, the former Republic of Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, is a, to attract uh, uh, foreign investment. Uh, also in okay. Eastern Europe, uh, the uh, US studio like to go in Praga or in Budapest to okay. shop films. Let's ask Carlo how he got his money. Where'd your money come from? Well, the picture that I'm represented is, is okay. very much what I see in my daily um, struggle to get financed. Two points though. Film is an industry that um, occupies a lot of people, that sustains hundreds of thousands of families, and it's, at least in Italy, increasing occupation. We're all desperate, desperate to find, you know, jobs. And this is something that, this is an industry that it's growing in terms of occupation. So public funding is not just just, but is smart. Andre can confirm that every single euro, public euro spent in cinema, returns in terms of social contribution five or six folds, more or less, which is one of the industry with the highest return to the taxpayers. Let me show you something. You see this little thing here, it's called iPhone. Well, there is a study which says that all the essential patents that make this little object work were paid by public money. What I'm trying to say that in advanced capitalism, there is not a single industry that exists without public sustain. Oh, but what American, what about American independent film? Well, they are all funded by public money because they are all funded to private tax uh, how do you say, uh, um, deduction. So I should pay taxes, so I have in my pocket some money which is public, I should give it to the public, but no, I decide to give it to my friend to make a film, probably because my daughter is going to play the, the uh, lead role in the film or my son is going to be the runner. So again, there are no myths. There is no good cinema around the world which is not funded by public money and what they are doing is essential. Okay, you're getting some praise today for good work, well done. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> your press release on that. Michelle, how do you see the, st the funding structure? What is it that, uh, you know, your pyramid, what's at the top and what's at the bottom of, of your structure? Well, what's on the bottom is production. We don't want to invest in production because, as was said, uh, member states and various schemes do fund uh, production. By the way, we produce an awful lot of films in, uh, in, uh, in the EU, in Europe. I mean, more than 1,500 films every year. And not all of these films actually reach a screen, which is a pity. So they don't reach any audience. Okay. So we don't want to add to this situation. So we mainly focused on um, distribution. So we help films to circulate uh, okay. across the EU. And now we start investing in development because there's no good film with a proper development at the beginning. And that's where you can add value by uh, public funding at this level. Okay, very good. Daniel, your financing uh, is, sorry, we're going to talk a little bit later about this as well, but your, uh, briefly your experience of trying to get uh, finance for your products. It's, it's difficult to, to um, as least, at, at least in our experience, it is difficult to find um, funding. For, for one thing, you have to figure out which um, subsidies are out there. You, you, have to, you have to be very knowledgeable and not everything applies for you. For example, in, in European... So you need to be a funding expert. So yeah, you have to be, be an expert. I mean, there, there were parts where we really just were very reluctant because Every time we, we looked something up, we were not applicable okay. for that certain thing because we had to be a co-production with that country or in that. that. But most entrepreneurs, for example, outside the film industry, yeah. would say the first time they try it, they, they break their heart yeah. over it and probably it doesn't work. And yeah. Yeah, Michelle was talking about the, the failure rate yeah. of films as yeah. well. And yet we're seeing uh, some real returns on the financial side as well in terms of, of uh, tax invested. This is something for you to consider for the future. Do you feel stronger now to go to the next phase and look for more funding? Um, I think, as uh, uh, he, he said earlier, uh, it's, it's always a struggle. And, and uh, with every, every project, it's different. And, and uh, um, th th there is this. Do you feel like an entrepreneur? In, in some ways, but, but um, mostly I'm in it to, to tell a story, to, to make a film. I mean, it's, it's, it is an industry and I wouldn't m uh, make a film that I'm not, not okay. confident in that it's, it's valuable as, as a film that, that could okay. be promoted and sold, but in, in a way I'm, I'm more of, okay. of a storyteller. Let's check in with Leticia. Any comments? Yes, Brian, we've got a comment from Zaneta. She's wondering how to support young directors. Uh, she's yeah, asking if it's possible to create any platform for young artists who, for example, thanks to Erasmus, can just share their experience all together. Okay. Which brings us on to the next theme, in fact, skills and training. Let's start with Daniel. Skills and training, you know, the Youth Guarantee, for example, which is a, uh, was supposed to be Europe's big idea for getting unemployed youth in, into jobs four months after uh, leaving university, for example. Um, the idea is to match skills with the jobs market. Do you feel that the, the skill sets that you were given through education, through training, are really suited to the market that you're working in now? I mean, it's very difficult to say because everybody tries to find a different niche for themselves and um, uh, not, not only uh, what, what part of the, the film industry, whether you're a cameraman or an editor or so on, um, is, is uh, a part of that, but also where you would want to go. You want to go more into to, to documentary films or fiction okay. films. And so that's, that's um, something where... When, when you're looking for to, a team, do you see the skill set around you that you know you can really get a great job done and do it in a sensible way? Um, you're looking for a cameraman, you're looking for you know, the people who will edit at the end. Do you see the skill sets there to produce the great film? Of course, yeah. Okay. Carlo, you see the skill sets in your marketplace which are at the level they should be? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and it's very interesting because in recent years, um, an, a number of new um, programs to, to form and to, to prepare and to train producers came up, like Aave, Ace. And I think this is very important because we sometimes tend to focus on the skills either of, of directors or the crew, but the specific job of producing 
films is vital to the industry and I think it's very important that uh, we form new producer with new ideas that will topple us uh, when it will be time okay. with new ideas. Yeah, do you see your skill sets in your group uh, being developed or you're just not sure what's going to happen at the end of the education process? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't actually know because I, I think... Um, You're not at the other end of that process yet. Yeah, because okay. if you ask from students, they always find something that they want to know, okay. uh, something more they want to know. Okay. Alexandra, do you think uh, your student uh, colleagues are, are ready for the job market, ready for the, the cinematic market? Mm, yes, I think yes. Okay, that's a pretty confident answer. All right, Andre, do you see the, uh, from your statistics that people are moving in the right direction with the, the, the skill sets? Do you see evidence of this in, in the market? Well, we, we, we have no, no we, we didn't make any studies on uh, uh, really the, 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 the work. It's very difficult to obtain data on unemployment. It's a terrible meteorological problem, so I cannot really comment on this. But we'd like to come back to the issue of financing because uh, we have not yet uh, spoken of one of the major player in film production. Uh, it's TV. In most of the country, uh, 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 important part of the financing of films uh, is done by uh, the broadcaster. Okay. Uh, Pre-sales or in direct investment. The system are very different country by country. In some, some countries like France, it's uh, by law that uh, uh, the broadcaster have to, to invest in, uh, in production. In some other country, it's more uh, agreement between uh, the okay. association of producer and the broadcaster, but th they are major players. Okay, Let's, we're going to move on to our next theme, catch up on some time, and uh, we're going to talk about the reality check, the day-to-day -day reality for directors. Start with Carlo. What's it like starting at the beginning and getting a film made at the end? As a director? Yeah. As a producer as well. As a producer, I mean, there are no recipes. Uh, it's an industry that produces prototypes, so <laughs> every time you start again, kind okay. of thing. But I would say that if the only um, strategy is about trying to do something that is deeply unique and original, try to do something that nobody else can do. And in a way, I think this is also a good suggestion for the industry in general. If we really want to defend the European film industry, it is all about making films that nobody else can do. Okay, that's nice for sure. Is this something you're looking for in terms of content, quality, originality? Not so much actually, because it's very difficult to define quality. I mean, but you know it when you see it. Yeah. Uh, it, it's an industry, so one of the criteria is of course the bottom line, whether the film makes money or not, but it doesn't say anything on quality. Uh, you have some indicators like is the film uh, shown in festivals, for instance? Does it get does it get uh, good reviews? Uh, is the box office is obviously a criterion. It's very difficult because again we are so diverse. We, films come f from 30, 35 countries, 40 countries okay. maybe. It's difficult to have a single criterion. It's easier for the Americans, honestly. I mean, they have recipes for good films. They have recipes for success. Sometimes it works out. We so try too hard to be original in Europe. Sometimes we try. I mean, if you look at Lucy, for instance, the film from Luc Besson, yeah. it's, uh, it's probably a French film, I would say. But it's typically an American thing in terms of the recipes okay. uh, which were used. He sold out then, did he? Oh, you're not going to comment. Fine. Uh, Andre, you see the day-to-day -day reality of the directors at the the big scale, do you, do you appreciate what it takes to get into your statistics at the end, Is that success level? Well, you know, when elaborating statistics and being on the same time, as I think I am a, a cinephile, sometimes it's very uh, tragic because films that you like, and when you see the statistics, they have done 2,100 2, uh, admissions. Okay. And when stupidities make millions of admissions. And uh, just to give one idea, uh, uh, some kind of average success at the European level for uh, art house films uh, from a 
a, a film with uh, awards in Cannes. Let's take the example of the La Vida del. Uh, in uh, uh, blue, it's the warmest color. Won the Palme d'Or last year in Cannes. Uh, it makes around two million admissions for the whole uh, Europe. And it's two million of admissions, it's a normal uh, level for a film with a Palme d'Or in Cannes. It will be a bit more if it's Polanski, if it's uh, Terence Malik, but it's dramatic because it means that the films receiving the major award in Europe attract only two million people in the theatres. Of course, other people will see the film on TV, on video, on uh, VOD, okay. uh, pirate version, but only two million persons will go I, to see. I don't know how many people are, are illegally downloading Polanski films. That would be an interesting statistic. Uh, you would be surprised. <laughs> you would be surprised. Okay, Daniel, also, uh, the, the day to day reality of this, uh, tell us uh, briefly your story. With, with our film? Yeah. Um, we went, I mean, there, uh, we had only, um, or we saw, I mean, um, as I said, I'm, I'm not sure that we're aware of every European funding possibilities, but, but uh, we were a small production without any TV money involved. You start with or, friends or colleagues? How did it work? Yeah, and uh, so we, we, we founded a small production company because we wanted really to make this this uh, do it seriously, film. do it professionally. Um, and uh, so we, we tried to get um, funding. Um, How long did it take you to make the film? Hmm? How long did it take you to make the film to this point? I don't, a, a, a couple of years at least. Okay. We, we've, we've been working on, on getting the money together the last two or okay. three years, yeah. That's pr pretty tough going. Yeah. Alexander, would you be interested in making a film, taking a couple of years to do it and still not seeing a result at the end? No. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, it takes a special kind of courage, I think, to do this. It's really something. Letitia, what have we got on social media? Yes, Brian, maybe I'm going, I want to highlight the last comment maybe of today. So, of Giorgio, he asks always, why we always ask Europe to do everything? Is it not a matter for the national level? After all, we have 28 cultures in Europe, he stressed. So why are we trying to create just one European culture? Okay, I just want to, Michelle, to answer this, then we're going to move on to, to our next topic. Uh, shouldn't this just be at the national level? Well, it is largely at, at national level because the uh, national and regional level brings 20 times more than we do bring with uh, the, the, the European schemes. Uh, but if we, if we don't intervene, who will take care of uh, transnational circulation of films? I mean, there's a gap here. It's a single market. It's a single market, but we, if we don't promote European films, as we discussed before, nobody will buy them. So there needs to be a support to distribution. And that's where the European added value is. At the same time, when we do it, it's very nice. I mean, we promote cultural diversity. We're all very much in favor of that. But we also create new sources of revenues for producers, directors, all the operators of uh, cinema industry. So that's also good for our economy. We're okay. looking for growth and jobs everywhere. So this is a sector which brings a, a tremendous amount of uh, jobs in the EU. Okay. Let's move on to how to expand European cinema within the EU and globally as well. Short answers on this. Just tell your best ideas. How do we uh, make a bigger impact? Daniel, what do you think we need to do to make a bigger impact with European cinema in the EU and outside? I mean, when we d distinguish between, we always distinguish between European and American cinema. Basically, these are the t two opposites that we've uh, come out. And what it boils down to is two things, I think, advertising and acceptance. Because I think most people are more, American films have more money invested and a more established way of advertising them. So every everybody's aware of them. And, Do you think um, they're better at making films or just better at advertising? I wouldn't, I wouldn't demonize American films. I really like, uh, and I wouldn't usually make this distinction between Euro but European intelligence. you think we just need to be better at the advertising side of it? The advertising is definitely better. Okay. Everybody's aware of this. And the other thing is really that, that we have different levels of acceptance um, okay. in Europe of people seeing those films. For example, in France, pe people are more, much more willing to see French films. Okay. Than, than, for example, they, they have been okay. a long this, time This may be Germany. a reason why the, the French broadcasting authorities seem to invest much more in the film industry compared with other countries, Andre. Do, what would you do, in, in a nutshell, what would you do to expand our reach within Europe and outside? 
the, the, the European market. What would you do to expand the European cinema market inside Europe and outside? Well, inside of Europe, I think uh, the major thing to develop, in my opinion, is to develop uh, film literacy, to teach people, young people, to watch films from other countries, from other cultures, from other way of telling stories. Uh, the two million of people going to see the Palme d'Or is not enough. And we have to convince people that if a film won the major awards, it's worth to be seen. And to approach these films, uh, it needs some preparation. Okay, it needs some intellectual training from the public. Carlo, you optimistic enough to believe that intellectual training in the public will shift our, our market? Well, yes, and also there is something to understand. I have no solution, to be honest, but at the moment, I think that the rules that regulate distribution in theaters uh, and distribution online, what we call windows, that are fantastic to protect theaters, and I completely agree with that, but sometimes <laughs> tend to be a little bit strict. Uh, I really believe in offer. I really think that if a film, the, the, the best way to combat and win piracy is offering a wide legal selection of films for everybody. Okay, for Michelle, we still don't have really a, a copyright law which permits a single market when it comes to film distribution, do we? Well, we need to update it at least because the, the, the current framework dates back to 2001. So, I mean, at the time there was no online distribution, so we need to update it definitely. Okay, Letitia, social media, what do we got? Yeah, the last comment maybe from Florin, who is wondering if the TTIP, the Trade uh, International Agreement with the United States, will poss possibly maybe kill the European film industry. What do you think? Okay, France is really sensitive about this. I'll go back to Michelle for this. TTIP, good or bad for European cinema? Well, I mean, it's good for the European economy insofar as we don't discuss cinema with the Americans because then the, the discussion is unbalanced. And obviously, if we have a free trade area, okay. we can say hello, goodbye to the European cinema. Okay. You have one idea for this, Alana? No, but I have one question, yes. actually. Um, I want to know what are the three greatest challenges of European movie today? Because we talk about a little bit about it, but I want three specific things that okay, are let's, the greatest let's, challenges. We'll, go, we'll do four, in fact, and we'll do one short answer. Andre, what's the biggest uh, challenge? I, I think for me, the, the major risk for the, the industry is currently the European or worldwide circulation of video on demand services which are not regulated sometimes by uh, European law or national law, and uh, the services do not have to contribute to the funding. So for a national uh, broadcaster or a national provider of VOD services who is obliged to contribute to the uh, national fund, is obliged to invest in production, but competitors coming from other countries, coming from directly from the US or coming from countries like Luxembourg or no, Netflix is based in the Netherlands without any obligation, are in better uh, okay. uh, position to, to compete without obligation. And I think this is a major risk because then the national uh, stakeholders will ask a reduction of the obligations. And this is a major risk for the funding of the, of the Daniel. Funds. What do you think is the biggest challenge and biggest risk facing uh, facing European cinema? As I as I said before, I think it's it's uh, perception. It's it's really how we perceive that because okay. we we have made this distinction between something that's entertaining. We had this example of the okay. last Luc Besson film because it was almost too entertaining. I mean, if I boil that down a little, okay. Um, it, is it is it really that? Does does European cinema only have to be this or that? And what is that? Okay, and I think that's. We got just over a minute left, Carlo. In ten seconds, what's the biggest challenge for European cinema faces? Make good popular films. Okay. The top box office in 1964 was Rocco and his brothers by Luchino Visconti. There were divas, stars in it, and it was a wonderful piece of art. And people went to see it. Why? Because it was fantastic. Okay, Michelle, the biggest uh, risk, biggest challenge? Well, I think the, the risk is that we, we don't manage to get adapted to the new digital world. That's basically the major challenge for us. Okay, let me just thank our guests, Michelle Magnier, Carlo Crestadino, Andre Lange, 
Daniel Mainz, thank you, and our students, Yolanda Panzer and uh, Alexander Boeron from Romania also. Uh, our discussion today has been broad. There is a lot which is misunderstood about cinema in Europe, but there's a lot of optimism. Uh, small fighters um, who are more nimble have an opportunity for new markets, for niche markets, and Europe has a lot of small markets which positioned right could put themselves in line for new opportunities with the right skills, the right training, and uh, the right opportunities supported by uh, national broadcasters, the European Commission, uh, crowdsourced uh, uh, when this uh, opportunity arises as well. But for a new generation of cinema, uh, we have global examples of real success within Europe. We also see more Americans coming to Europe to make big productions. Game of Thrones made uh, in Europe, uh, one of the most successful series. Uh, Borgen translating across uh, a language barrier which no one would have believed before. Subtitles are not a trade barrier any longer. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Leticia, for your contribution also and our commentators on social media. Thanks, uh, <laughs> The future of European cinema is bright.